Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Cover 2 Podcast. My name is Nick Nenad. And I'm Jared Smith. And guys, we have another football-filled podcast to discuss this week. We will also be getting into the madness that is NBA free agency and the NBA draft. So much to talk about on this podcast. It's going to be a fun one. We want to wish everybody happy Thanksgiving this Thursday. You might even be listening to this Thanksgiving morning. If you're listening to this during Thanksgiving, that'd be kind of weird. So don't do that. But any other time, uh, happy Thanksgiving. And we hope everyone has a safe Thanksgiving, considering what's been going on in the world with, of course, the coronavirus. I want to start this podcast, though, uh, with a short little tidbit on college uh, basketball. College basketball returns this week, guys. And although you might be skeptical and you might think that the college basketball season is, is going to end really badly because of the coronavirus. I'm still excited. There's nothing a guy like me likes more than having like 80 games to choose from on a random Tuesday, Wednesday night. I don't care if it's Duke. I don't care if it's UCI, UCLA, Kentucky, Louisville. It doesn't matter to me. College basketball is always really, really fun. And at least it can create some normalcy again with this sports world. The fact that we now have the NFL running strong. We have the NBA starting soon again, when normally the NBA would be on right now. Uh, we have the NHL starting soon. Now we have college basketball starting around its exact uh, starting point. So at least for a sports fan like me, it creates a sense of normalcy. And I'm glad we have more sports to watch on TV. Yeah, I'm sticking with college athletics, but I'm actually going to go to football. And tomorrow on Tuesday will be the first uh, official college football rankings. And, you know, I don't think there's going to be many surprises, but listen, there could be some some teams in that five, six seed that may surprise some, right? We, we have Oregon, who's only played three games with the Pac-12 being one of the last conferences to actually get their season started, right? So they're, they're potentially in the mix, right? But, but you know, there's still the talk of why only four teams in the playoffs with this year, with how crazy everything has been. Why did the committee not expand the college football playoffs to at least six and potentially even eight or 10? So at the current moment, we're still stuck with four, right? And, and right now I think you have to put Alabama at number one. I think Notre Dame being undefeated at eight and no uh, deserves to be in as well. Ohio state at four and no right there in the big 10 and their season was delayed as well. And then Clemson, even though they do have that one loss to Notre Dame, it was only by it was a, a by a seven point loss, and they didn't have Trevor Lawrence. So I think Clemson is still a legitimate football team, and they they deserve to be in, right? And then we've got the teams on the outside, uh, Texas A and M. They're sitting at five and one. They've looked really good. Uh, I believe their only loss was to Alabama. And then we've got uh, Florida sitting at six and one, and they look to be one of the hottest teams in all of college football. So. You know, at the top, it, there may not be any surprises, but I'm I'm really interested to see w- how the committee ranks those, you know, five to eight seeds, and we're really going to get a, a, a first opportunity to see what the committee thinks about this college football season. Yeah, it's very interesting, Jared, about college football too, because you got the Cincinnati Bearcats at number seven as well. Like that, that this would be the perfect year, right, to have that eight team give a team like Cincinnati a chance. Hey, you're going to play Ohio State or Alabama first. If you can beat them, you can beat anybody, right? This is the one year where I think eight teams would have worked perfectly. Cincinnati with a big win this weekend. I am very excited to see how uh, how this all ends up if Cincinnati ends up undefeated. But let's get to pro football, and we're going to do what we usually do. Jared and I are going to give you two games that we want that we want to discuss from last weekend, and we will give you one game to look forward to and analyze uh, this upcoming weekend. So I get to start and I am starting with Sunday night football Chiefs and Raiders divisional matchup old school rivalry what a game this was Jared 66 total points 35 31 Patrick Mahomes to Travis Kelsey to end the game the one thing I really want to talk about with this game was the reason the Raiders didn't have a chance to win at the end and that's the odd decision by John Gruden to not go for it on fourth and goal from about the one or two yard line early on in the first half. The score was 14-14. The Raiders had been trudging downfield. I believe they they hadn't punted yet in the game, so it was two touchdowns, and this was their third drive. 
And Gruden, instead of pounding in with Josh Jacobs or Devontae Booker or um, throwing a pass to Jason Witten like they did later in the game or trying to find Nelson Aguilar or someone like that, Darren Waller, they decided to kick a field goal. And guess what ended up happening at the end of the game? They lost by four. If they score a touchdown there, that's where the four points comes in. And it's 35-35, and the Chiefs just tie it at the end of the game. It creates more of a sense of urgency for the Chiefs. Maybe they make a mistake. So I was very dumbfounded why Gruden, in a divisional game, when you're already 1-0 against the Chiefs, why you'd be conservative against the most non-conservative team in the NFL. It baffled me. I called it out. I said it on Twitter. I'd say it would bite him in the ass. And it ended up, uh, you know, it ended up costing them the win. And now the Raiders are not going to win the division. They're in sixth or seventh place. A couple teams win and they lose. They might not make the playoffs. And that's how big of a decision this might have been. Jared, I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on this game and specifically uh, that decision. Yeah, no, listen, you laid it all out, right? Obviously, John Gruden has to own up for that mistake because that's exactly what it was, a mistake. Uh, When you're playing Kansas City, when you're playing a high-potent offense like that, you have to be able to, number one, match that potency and be able to to keep going, which the Raiders did for the majority of that game, except for that one mistake, right? But you have to be able to take chances. And I think what we've seen a lot this year, and even going back to somewhat last year as well, teams are taking or have been taking more and more chances on fourth down. Fourth down percentages going forward on fourth down has gone up drastically. And I'm not talking about like, fake punts or anything like that. I'm talking about leaving the offense on the field and going for it. And and I don't think you mentioned this, Nick, but, or if you did, I'm sorry. But it, here's another thing with going for it on fourth and goal as well when the ball is on the one-yard line. Yeah. If you don't make it, the Chiefs get the ball at the one. So if you're the three, all you got to do is stop them, get a three and out, and then you're going to flip field position and you're going to get the ball back around yeah. like the 50 yard line again. Right? So exactly. even if you don't get it, you are, you are putting the Chiefs offense in a bind. You're putting them on the one yard line. Now, obviously, the Chiefs offense is great enough that, yes, they can probably get out of that and start a drive of their own. But you are completely changing the play calling, right? The the Raiders kicked a field goal and then had to kick off. The Chiefs then started on the 25 yard line. That is that is a way different type of play calling system or, or thought process as opposed to if you were backed up on the one. So you're right. That just simply was a mistake by John Gruden. And, and you're right. It came back to bite him in the ass. And they have now you know, lost to a division rival when they had an opportunity to potentially uh, win that series and go up 2-0 against the Chiefs. Uh, last thing I will say about about uh, Kansas City, and this is just kind of, uh, you know, just from a fan's perspective, why don't the Chiefs just go no huddle, two-minute, and I, and I tweeted this last time as well. <laughs> you did, you Chiefs did, yeah. go no huddle, two-minute offense for the entire game. They'd score 150 points. I mean, literally, Nick, there was a minute and like 43 left when the Chiefs got the ball back. They scored with less than a minute left they ended up having to use a timeout uh, because once they got down the field, one of their receivers was tackled inbound. So they had to use a timeout to set up the next play. But I mean, literally, like Patrick Mahomes, it was like he wasn't even phased. Like the dude didn't even sweat. He was like, all right, no big deal. Let me put my, like, give me my, give me my helmet. Let me go out here and do this real quick and then go back and sit on the sideline. It was like, literally, I'm serious. If they went no huddle and, and just, you know, threw the ball or let Patrick Mahomes call the plays, they would, they might average 100 points a game. And I'm not exaggerating about that. Like, I'm not talking about a Madden, you know, uh, c- controller video game here. I'm talking about professional athletes and sports. This team can put up points whenever they want to. Give credit to the Raiders for hanging in and and also scoring points. But the Chiefs from reality basically just said, you guys are still a little brother, right? It was good. You guys kept up with us for a little while. You, you punched us in the mouth. You know, because if we can remember a, a couple weeks ago, the Raiders went into Kansas City and beat them. Uh, but it's like, it's OK. You, you guys got one on us. But at the end of the day, we're still your daddy. It's pretty much what they just said. Yeah. I mean, Jared, you're so right, too, about that. Here's what their drive was. You're at 143 left in the fourth quarter. Ten yards, incomplete pass. Nine yards, 16 yards, 15 yards. Uh, short three-yard pass. The guy fell in bounds. He had to call timeout. Next play, 22 yards. Uh, sideways throw to Travis Kelsey for a touchdown. That's what it was. That's all that happened right there. That quick. All those were passes, by the way, when I was mentioning nine yards, 10 yards. So, yeah, Jared, and that's another reason why we go back. Raiders, no field goals. All right? I can understand if they were at the six-yard line or if they were at the seven. Go ahead and kick the field goal. I'm not arguing. But the fact that you were inside the three-yard line, inside the two-yard line, come on, man. You you, you can't do that, and that's why you end up losing. It was a – it was a uh, 
back and forth game. It was a shootout. And, you know, Gruden is going to be kicking himself because, you know, again, like I'm saying, Jared, that this, you know, they, they could have given themselves a real good chance, not only to be a better seed in the playoffs, but potentially even winning this division. And they didn't. I will say this, though. I'm excited if we somehow get a rematch between these teams in the playoffs. I'm down because if you add up the math, let me just do it really quickly. If you add up the math on these games, there was 66 points scored in this game, uh, and there was 138 points scored between the two games, between these two teams. So let's get a rematch. Yeah, let's get a rematch. It's 1-1, the trilogy, right? We see this in UFC. We, we see this in, in other sports. Let's get it, right? I, 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 I'd, be, I'd be absolutely down. This is the one year, Jerry, where we might get some interesting matches because of the coronavirus and all that stuff. We might have rematches in the college football playoff, uh, or excuse me, trilogies. It, it, it's really exciting. And one thing about this game, the Chiefs winning this, let's get that rematch in the playoffs, man. I think the Raiders are as legit as it gets as far as the team in the AFC this year. The Chiefs are obviously the Chiefs, and the Steelers are the Steelers. But I think the Raiders are like, you know, they're right there. They'd probably be in third or fourth place if they if they weren't playing, uh, if they if they did not play the Chiefs in this division. They're on the cusp. They're, they're definitely yeah. on the cusp. Uh, but but let's move on here because I really wanted to get to another intriguing matchup yes. from this week's football, right? And I'm talking about the two seven and one Cincinnati Bengals. <laughs> And the three and seven Washington football team, <laughs> right? Because I know everyone had this game circled on their calendar as the one that they were watching. Uh, no, I, they didn't. I, I really, you know, uh, for for sad reasons only, we are talking about this matchup, and that is because the number one overall pick, Joe Burrow, tore his ACL and his MCL and is out for the rest of the regular season. So a huge blow to the Cincinnati Bengals. And even though they were not going to make the playoffs. Uh, Joe Burrow was the one major bright spot for this Cincinnati Bengals team. So obviously, hopefully, uh, we wish him well and that he comes back healthy and, and better for next year. Uh, you know, but really what this game did or, or, or with what the injury did to Joe Burrow was it gave the Redskins an opportunity to win this game, which they did. And now the Redskins are tied for second place in the <laughs> NFC least, which if you listen to last week's podcast, I am now referring to the NFC East as the NFC least. Uh, it is the probably, arguably, the worst division in the entirety of the NFL. The NFL has been around for, ever. what, 60 plus years? For, ever, right? In the yeah, history. Ever. That's the worst the division NFL. ever. One of yeah. the worst divisions. Uh, and so the, the Washington Redskins sitting at three and seven right now. Each team in the NFC least has three wins, right? And the only reason that the Philadelphia Eagles are technically in first place is because they tied with those same Cincinnati Bengals weeks ago. And so they have six losses and not seven. So technically because they have six losses, they get the first place spot. But uh, Thanksgiving on Thursday, we're going to have the, the Dallas Cowboys who had actually an impressive win over the Thank Minnesota you. Vikings. Uh, not going to get into it, but the, the Cowboys surprised me and won. Uh, and so they are the other team that is tied for second place in the NFC least going up against the Washington football team. So actually, this game means something, right? I mean, a couple weeks ago, we, we were saying, like, I wasn't even going to watch this game, right? I mean, I'm sure we would have had it on. The family would have had it on. But I, we, we'd probably be, like, doing something else, like eating earlier or something like that. I might have to actually sit on the couch, pop open a beer, and watch this game now <laughs> because whoever wins this game will move ahead of the Eagles and get in the first place unless, of course, there is a tie, which – in, in in this world, this year, uh, with this NFC least, I'm not putting a tie out of the question. But uh, in all reality, whoever does win this game will win the NFC. So this segment wasn't necessarily about talking about the Cincinnati Bengals and the Washington football team in that actual game. It was more about just, uh, you know, trying to say that it was a tough loss for Joe Burrow. Hopefully he comes back strong next year. And because of that loss, because the Bengals basically just crumbled the Washington football team now has an opportunity uh, if they go into Dallas, Texas Stadium on Thursday on Thanksgiving and uh, elevate themselves in the first place some way, somehow. Good. Isn't it incredible that the Cowboys have a legitimate chance? Like, I thought the Cowboys were easy last place, right? They look like the best team. They look like, honestly, the best team at that performance against the Vikings. Mm-hmm. Say what you want about the Vikings, right? They're a pretty average team. They're not a horrible team. And the Cowboys really play well. Zeke finally got at it, right? That's really what the Cowboys are waiting for. Um, 
You know, real quick on Joe Burrow, obviously horrible with what happened to him. I think if you're the Bengals, it's not the worst thing because you're going to end up getting a real high draft pick now because you probably won't win a game for the rest of the season. The one thing, obviously, you you don't want to happen is for Joe Burrow to be affected for the rest of his career by something like this. Right. We have seen that before, but – you know, I'm rooting for Joe Burrow. Uh, he, he was a very talented quarterback. My dad, who, like, is kind of a pseudo-NFL fan, really liked watching Joe Burrow. I think it was the Thursday night football game earlier this season, Browns and Bengals. He was really impressed by him. And so there's a lot of people that are on the Burrow train. So I hope he gets better. But for the Bengals, you know, don't worry about it. As long as he's okay, you'll get another high pick. You'll maybe be able to trade back for one of these teams that wants a quarterback, right? Um, and, and you'll get some draft capital. Cool. So it, it, the, here's the thing talk, talking about talking about potentially yeah. getting a high pick right the the i guess the i don't know the one bright spot about joe burrow tearing his acl you're right they they more than likely will have a high draft pick and there's a left tackle out of oregon who ended up opting out of this season but yeah. he is clearly like by far the best left tackle will be a top five uh draft eligible prospect coming out this year if the Bengals can get him, and I'm sorry, I, I forget his name, and it's a little hard to pronounce, so I'm not even going to try. His last name is Sewell, I think. So, okay. It, well, it's not pronounced that easy. It, it sounds a little more funky than it yeah, is. I think it's something. Uh, but if the Bengals can get him, and he can be your left tackle and protect Joe Burrow's blind side for the next decade, that's, you know, that, then, then that's okay, right? And, and who knows? Maybe even with Joe Burrow, the Bengals still would have had a top five draft pick just because the rest of their team is so god-awful. Uh, but, you know, if the Bengals can come out of this with with that left tackle to protect Joe Burrow so that Joe Burrow doesn't tear his ACL again, right? Because obviously uh, the Bengals offensive line was not good in protecting Burrow, and that is the reason why he got hit the way he did and why he injured himself. So I, I don't like the play's blame on others, but, you know, it's not like Joe Burrow was sitting there, had five, six seconds to throw the ball. He was He was getting hurried and rushed the entire game. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, Jared, something we were, it was it was interesting that um, I was thinking about earlier this, this season. I don't remember what week it was, but I was like, you know, this line is so bad, this guy's going to get hurt. And then look what happened, the worst thing possible, right? They get, not only does he, does, he, does he get hurt, but he tears his ACL. That's a 9- to 12-month recovery. Like, Joe Burrow, unfortunately, might not play next year either with this kind of injury. So it, it'll be very, very interesting. Um, the, it, the thing about Sewell, too, is he actually was the left tackle for Justin Herbert at Oregon um, during that Rose Bowl game and during Jersey Herbert's career. So maybe Bengals and Chargers battling for left tackle spot, right? Like who's going to get that guy? So um, again, not the worst things for the Bengals football wise, but for Joe Burrow, the worst thing that possibly could happen. And about the NFC East, here, I'm going to tell you this right now. I have no idea who's winning the division. Like I have, I actually, the Giants have been playing better. Washington has Alex Smith at their quarterback. I think that's the best quarterback they'd be playing right now. Uh, the Cowboys look better. If they can get Zeke going, they can win it. And uh, the Eagles, maybe that 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 uh, tie ends up helping them out. That's the only thing. I think the Eagles are the worst team in this division, which is hilarious now yeah. when you're looking at it. Um, and the one thing, I do want to apologize real quick before I go on to my uh, next game. I want to apologize to Doug Peterson because – when Doug Peterson didn't go for it uh, during that tie game, I said, that's bad football. It's going to end up, you know, killing you in the end of the, the game. No, that was a good decision, Jared. He saw the future, and he saw that this division was so bad that a tie was better than potentially throwing an interception and getting it returned or something like that. So credit to Doug Peterson. Like I said before the season, him, Carson Wentz, or both are going at the end of the season. I think that one decision just saved Doug Peterson's career in Philly. It's going to be Wentz that leaves after the season. I'll put bets on it. All right. Uh, switching up to my next matchup, and that is going to be the New Orleans Saints versus the Atlanta Falcons. Garrett, you might be wondering why I'm bringing up the Atlanta Falcons at all on this podcast. Yeah. Uh, and it's because of Taysom Hill and the New Orleans Saints. I'll say this, Jared. This game did not start out well for Hill. He looked he, he looked discombobulated. It was a real low score. It was like 6-6 six to six at one point. Um, and then you started to see what since it started when, when he got the flow of the game and he started getting his quarterback senses going, you know, he became a very, very good quarterback. Do I think that the Saints want Taysom Hill to be their playoff quarterback? No. But I do think that the Saints will end up, you know, they'll make the playoffs. They still have a good chance of winning the division. And Drew Brees being on IR for at least two more weeks 
it's not the worst thing to have Taysom Hill as your quarterback. So he impressed me. I was very skeptical uh, when I heard that it wasn't going to be Jameis Winston because Taysom Hill, Jared, he hasn't been a quarterback in the NFL ever, right? He's technically a quarterback, but he hadn't played quarterback. I think it was like 10 throws or something like that, 10 completions. I don't remember what it was. Uh, no touchdown passes. He impressed me. And I think if the Saints can keep doing what they're doing and he gets used to the playbook, I think, you know, they could win any game with Taysom Hill. So I was pleasantly surprised. And for the Saints, if you're a Saints fan, uh, you're looking at those two wins against Tampa and you're like, we're good because we have a solid quarterback right now. Uh, and Drew Brees can take as much time as he can um, and hopefully just be back for the playoffs. That's my thoughts on this game. Well, you know, listen, really quickly, this this one was interesting, right? Because going into Sunday, uh, multiple reporters who were covering these two teams had come out and said that, you know, the, the Saints, not only locker room, but front office was split on who should actually start. If it should be Jameis, um, who was the actual technical backup quarterback, or if it should be Taysom Hill, right? And obviously head coach Sean Payton made the uh, final decision to go with Taysom Hill. And, and I think that was because... When the Saints re-signed Taysom Hill this offseason, uh, reportedly Sean Payton had told J Taysom Hill, if for some reason Drew Brees gets injured, we're going to give you a shot. And, and Sean Payton, I think, was basically, you know, staying true to his word and telling Taysom Hill, hey, man, I'm, I'm not backing down out of this. You are our guy. Right. So I don't think it was really anything that Jameis didn't do. I think, you know, all the reports are saying Jameis had impressed coaches. He's he's been, you know, humble and all that stuff. But I think it was just Sean Payton saying, hey, man, I, I told this guy I was going to give him an opportunity. Now I've yeah. got to stand by my word and do that. And obviously, you know, it, it, it took a little while for Taysom Hill to get started. But like you mentioned, he never started at quarterback in his entire NFL career. So, uh, yeah, he was going to have a little bit of growing pains. But guess what? I think he 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 kind of adjusted on the fly um, and, and he did fairly well. And, and it was when, you know, if he was hesitant about throwing, he could just easily run. And he's like a damn bowling ball. For, uh, you know, he's he's almost like he's not as big as Gronk, but good luck trying to tackle that guy. Right. So now you yeah. don't have to you not just have to worry uh, about his throwing ability. But if a play breaks down, he's just going to run on you. And so, you know, I, I think it was the smart decision to do that. And, you know, for for I think going forward, uh, Taysom Hill will only uh, get more experience and more reps, even when Drew Brees does come back, because let's not forget, it's not like Drew Brees you know, just had like an ankle sprain or oh, yeah. I don't know, a sprained wrist or something like 11 cracked, broken ribs Come on, and man. a punctured lung. OK, so even when Drew, if Drew Brees does come back in two weeks, which would be an amazing feat for after, you know, doing the injury, uh, suffering the injury that he had, there's no way he's going to be at 100 percent. And so I think we're still going to see Taysom Hill mixed into this offense and, and incorporated. It's not just going to be the automatic Drew Brees show again. Maybe when we get towards the playoffs in like five, six, seven weeks, you know, hopefully Drew Brees will be more at 100 percent by then. But I, I think for the near future, we're going to continue to see Taysom Hill going forward. Yeah. Well, and Jared, it's a perfect scenario. Uh, and if you're the Saints, you look at the, the rest of their schedule uh, for the next three weeks, uh, which is likely the games that Drew Brees will miss. They play the Broncos. They play the Falcons again. And they play the good old Eagles. So. This is these are the games that you want Taysom Hill to be in. You know who they play after those three games? The Chiefs. That's when you want Drew Brees back, right? Uh, they play the Chiefs on December 20th. That's week uh, 15. And so that's when you want Drew Brees back. But I, again, like I'm saying, Saints already have a, a, technically a two game lead on Tampa, even though they only have a one game lead. It could be two could be two game lead if if the, if the Buccaneers uh, lose on Monday night tonight. Uh, which would almost solidify the Saints winning the division. But they have a good enough lead over the Buccaneers right now to where this is the time to have Taysom Hill uh, as your quarterback. They end the season with the Chiefs, the Vikings, and the Panthers, all better teams than the teams they play in the next three weeks. So uh, very, very interesting there. Um, Jared, why don't you discuss the last game that you want to talk about from this past week? Yeah, uh, and, and it is simply the Fraud Bowl. And by the fraud bowl, I'm talking about the Tennessee Titans and the Baltimore <laughs> right? And into this matchup, obviously, these are two, you know, good teams. Their, their records speak for themselves. Uh, the, the Ravens were, were sitting at, uh, I believe it was six and three. And the Tennessee Titans were sitting at uh, six and three as well. So 
you know, obviously whoever won this game was just going to get a bigger jump. And both teams were fighting for uh, divisional spots. Obviously, Tennessee Titans have the Indianapolis Colts that are right there neck and neck. And the Baltimore Ravens are currently looking up at the undefeated and still undefeated after beating the Jacksonville Jaguars, Pittsburgh Steelers. So, you know, going into this game, I was like, I want to pick the Ravens. I think Lamar Jackson's going to, you know, have a better game than he did uh, last postseason when the Tennessee Titans came in and kind of shocked the world and beat them. Plus, I had Lamar Jackson in my fantasy, so I had to kind of go with the Ravens. (laughs) Uh, but guess what? Listen, they come up short, right? And and the reason why I'm I'm calling Tennessee fraud as well is because uh, they lost to the Bengals earlier this year, and they beat the Texans, but it was 42 to 36. They gave up 36 points to the Houston Texans, who are next to the Jets, one of the worst teams in all football. So I don't trust Tennessee, even though this was a very good win against the Ravens. Uh, I just don't trust them. And and as far as the Ravens go, um, can we talk about the defense for a minute, right? Because it's not like they gave up 60 points or anything. But um, if you watched any of that second half play, the Ravens did not want to tackle Derrick Henry, right? And, and I think uh, Derrick Henry did exactly what he does to most teams is he's, he wears you down eventually. He is so big, so physical, and so bruising that in the first and second quarter, when defenses are fresh, they're able to, you know, uh, kind of kind of get a hold of Derrick Henry, tackle him. You don't really see Derrick Henry breaking off many big-time runs in the first half. But in the second half, when when defenses are a little bit more tired, you know, their stamina isn't at full strength. Um, we really saw Baltimore and their defensive players kind of making business decisions, as I like to say, and saying, you know what, I, I'm not going to go head up with Derrick Henry. I'm going to kind of go to the side and try to see if I can just like get him down at his feet. And obviously, Derrick Henry is way too athletic to to fall for that. And, and you know, we saw A.J. Brown. Uh, a touchdown pass where I, I believe he broke like three or four tackles, made the Baltimore Ravens look like a JV high school football team. It, it, it was unreal. So for me, this was the, the about the physicality of the Tennessee Titans and the lack thereof that the Baltimore Ravens showed. And guess what? Baltimore it doesn't get any easier for you guys because you guys get a short week and you get Ooh. to travel to Pittsburgh on Thanksgiving night. So I hope they have short memories. Because they, they don't have any time to really sulk on this Tennessee loss. They've got to get ready uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, who, are, or like I said, are currently undefeated. And, and it's a rivalry game, right? Thanksgiving night, um, you know, uh, and, uh, sorry, I, I blinked right there. But basically, for the Ravens, they could easily, you know, go into next week at 6-5. and five. And I don't know. I mean, I, there's obviously a still chance, a good chance that they can make the playoffs. But for now, fraud. Fraud, fraud, fraud. Now, Jerry, uh, we're going to talk about next week, uh, next week's football games. Why don't you just carry on? Talk about that Ravens-Steelers game. Um, you were mentioning it. Thursday night football, Thanksgiving night. We've actually seen the Steelers and Ravens on Thanksgiving night before. I can remember sitting at my uh, aunt and uncle's house watching these games back when Ray Lewis and Trey Palomalu right. and uh, you know Joe Flacco and Ben Roethlisberger were going at it. It, 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 this is going to be a big time matchup. So talk about that matchup um, real quick next week. This is that's probably the biggest game all, all next week, to be honest. Uh, well, I would say it's probably the biggest Thursday, uh, you know, Thanksgiving matchup by far. And and here's the thing: uh, for everything I just said about Baltimore and how they're frauds, which they are, you know, with rivalry games, I, you do throw the records out the window. I don't care what sport it is. I don't care if it's professional, collegiate, high school, whatever. True rivalry games, you throw the records out the window because, listen, the, the Ravens know Baltimore's scheme. Baltimore knows Raven, the Ravens. Uh, I'm sorry, Baltimore knows Pittsburgh's scheme. And this is really going to be about who can be more physical. Right now, I'm leaning towards the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, based off of what I saw from the Baltimore Ravens this past Sunday. If I'm the Steelers, I am running the ball with James Conner 30 to 35 times in this game. Right. I might run it five to six straight times and just say, try to stop us. Because what we've seen on tape so far, you guys can't stop a nosebleed. And now I will say the uh, the fact that Clayus Campbell, the the you know yeah. all pro defensive tackle for the Ravens, is currently out. And I don't believe he'll be playing in this Thursday night matchup uh, either is a big loss for Baltimore because he is a, a not only a run stuffer, but he can get after the quarterback as well. So that's a major loss for them. But 
Baltimore's defense, uh, you know, on paper is still technically good. They still have good players around them. They drafted Justin Matabuke, uh, I believe, in the second or third round out of uh, Texas A&M. And so when you're a second or a third rounder, like, you're supposed to be pretty good. Right now, I'm not saying that you're an all-pro Calais Campbell type, but for, for that defensive line to get pushed around like that, I, I would hope that they're pissed off. Right? I hope that they come into this game uh, fired up. And, and not to say that they have to be, you know, disrespectful or any, di- disrespectful and, you know, go to midfield and kind of stomp on the, the Pittsburgh Steelers logo like the Tennessee Titans did to Baltimore. But I want to see Baltimore come out with some fire. Like, if they get an unsportsmanlike 15-yard penalty, I'm okay with that. Because I want to see that, like, show, show me some fire, man. Show me some passion. Like, they should be embarrassed by the, the way that they ended this game against Tennessee. So... I hope Baltimore comes out with that passion and that fire and that energy, because I think we all know that Pittsburgh will, right? Obviously, they've got that target on their back as the best team in all of football, undefeated. Everyone's waiting to see if we know when they're going to fall off or if they're going to continue their undefeated streak. So if you're Baltimore, you know, listen, the the the, the light's on you, right? Spotlight's on them. And, and I will be very curious to see how well they respond after a bad loss. Yeah, Jared, this it's a big matchup because, you know, like you said, mentioned uh, division rivals. It's a 10-0 and team versus a struggling 6-4 and team. I'm not confident with the Ravens. And, Jared, I'm kind of getting behind you on the on the frauds. Uh, this is definitely nice. You shouldn't be getting behind. You should be jumping on with two feet in both hands, like full on frauds. Here, I, it's, it's almost like, Jared, I just expect them to adjust. Remember, we talked about this last week. I expect – the Ravens to adjust and they haven't done it yet. It, it really is amazing. You know, the Steelers, they're 10-0, right? And I, they don't a lot of times play like they're a 10-0 team. That's the problem. So there is a chance the Ravens can win this game and there's a chance anybody can beat the Steelers. They're not the New England Patriots of 2007. But it, it just seems like why would I trust Lamar and the offensive coordinator Jim Harbaugh to win this game when they couldn't win all the others. And Tomlin was smiling on the sidelines and wasn't even scared of Lamar Jackson. I agree with you. I want to see some old, uh, old school stuff. I want to see some fighting. I want to see them dig up the, uh, the the midfield. I remember there was a college game. I think it was Georgia a couple of years ago. A guy did that on uh, and really chopped up the field so bad that it almost looked like they, they had to stop the game for a you second. You know who that was? Well, it could have been Georgia what? as well. Uh, but it was it was a Pittsburgh Steelers player who's actually on in, injured reserve, uh, Devin Bush, their their oh. linebacker, who, okay. who, who Michigan. played in Michigan. They were playing in Michigan State, and he actually did that. He tore up that Michigan right. State field. So another rivalry game, you know. So yeah, Baltimore, go in there and tear up that field, man. Like get pissed off. I I, I want to see some fire. They should have Devin Bush go do it. Right. Oh no, that's that that's uh that's Steelers. That's Steelers. But he, he yeah. plays for the Steelers, so that I don't know. <laughs> I'd be weird. It'd be weird on your own home field. Um, yeah, no, very, very interesting Thursday night game. I want to move to Sunday, though, and it's a team you just talked about, Jared, and I have to disagree a tiny bit with you calling the Titans frauds. Oh, no, they're I, frauds. I don't think the Titans are frauds. 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 Did they not play well yesterday? No, and Tannehill made a lot of bad throws yesterday and really kept that game uh, going. Right? We, You're we talk- only helping my argument right now, no, by no, the way. No, no, I'm just saying it's one game, though. It's one game against a – Good defense. I'm not saying the Ravens' defense is bad. I'm saying their offensive play calling is bad. So I'm not 100% on you there. They play the Colts, though. And before the Titans played the uh, Ravens on Thursday Night Football a few weeks ago, or two, a couple weeks ago, they played the Colts. And they lost by 17. Now, when you look at the statistics from this game, you might go, okay, well, they lost 34 to 17. How was this a close game? And that's my argument. This was closer than people think, and there's one big thing that happened in this game that needs to change for Tennessee, and that's limiting mistakes, specifically special teams mistakes. And the reason I'm saying that, Jared, is because when they played the Colts two weeks ago, they were in it, and they were winning that game um, going into uh, going into halftime. And to start the uh, to start the third quarter, to start the second half of that game. The Colts went all the way down to the one-yard line, and unlike John Gruden, went for it on fourth and down, uh, fourth and goal at the one. They didn't get it. So what ends up happening? The Titans have to play from their own end zone. 
Uh, they only gained nine yards. They have to punt it. And what happened? The punter shanked it 20 yards, gave the ball to the Colts at the 27-yard line of Tennessee. That's how bad the punt was. And it's because he was backed up in territory, exactly what the Ra- Raiders should have done. Um, and then uh, the Titans get the ball back the next drive. They get a blocked punt and a touchdown return from the Colts. And then on their next drive, they miss a big-time field goal being down 10. So those special teams mistakes were the reason that they lost that game against the Colts. If those things didn't happen, they're right in that game, and it's going back and forth, and the Titans would have had the ball last and might have even won that game. So that's why I'm saying let's hold it on the Titans. If they just don't make mistakes, they can beat the Colts, and that's what I think about this game. I would go. I'm going to go Titans beat the Colts uh, this Sunday in the rematch. Uh, 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 yeah, I, listen, I, I, I'm calling them frauds, but that doesn't mean that they can't go and beat the Colts. Well, so and, do, and are the Colts frauds then too, Jared? Are the Colts frauds? No, we get well. I, I gotta like look, pull up their schedule here, but uh, and, and, and see who they play because I can't might, remember. That might create off the top a little. Head. Whenever you have Phil Rivers as your quarterback, though, there's some fraudulent activity going on, right? Because when you think Phil Rivers in Super Bowl. It doesn't usually connect. So maybe that's where we could put Colts frauds in there. That the fact that they their quarterback. Yeah. Fraud listen, it's cool. you know, you know what it is? You know why the Colts aren't frauds yet? Because it's still too early. Right? I know we're about to go into week twelve, but like give me like two weeks. Okay. When when things really start to heat up. Jared, if they get killed by the Titans, are they frauds? No, no, no. I said, yeah, I said like give me like two weeks. Yeah, okay. Give me give me a couple weeks. Because it, it it's not it's not real yet. Like like Indianapolis and Tennessee, they're they're still right there neck and neck. But like, give, give me a couple weeks when 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 the pressure really starts to mount. Like, say the Colts get like a, a two game lead over Tennessee. Say they say they beat Tennessee this week, and then the Colts win next week as next week as well. And it's almost like okay, like it's their division to lose. That's when I think we're gonna see Phil Rivers just crumble and and start to really feel himself. And he's gonna start throwing interceptions, and that's when we're gonna see the Colts like lose three straight. Like, look, they play the Titans. And then they they get the the Texans in Houston, then they get the Raiders, and then they get the Texans again, and then the Steelers and the Jaguars. So those two Texans matchups, obviously they'll be favored in those. The Raiders, you know, I would say that's a that's a fairly even matchup right there. Uh, the Steelers uh, is obviously the Steelers are undefeated still, and they're a very good team. And then the Jaguars. So you know, I, I could see the Colts losing one of those games to the Texans. Uh, I could see them losing to the Raiders. I can see him losing to the Steelers, obviously. That that's you know, nothing to write home about. And and they already lost to the Jaguars in week one. So who knows? Right? So so yeah, if, if we get to, you know, a couple more weeks in the season, then I'll officially call the Colts frauds. But I'm gonna hold off on that just for I soon. think I think they've got they've won a couple games, they've strategized well against the Packers, they've strategized well against the Titans. I think this is that 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 the, these are the three games right here. They'll lose to the Titans, they'll lose to the Texans, and they'll lose to the Raiders uh, on the road in Las Vegas. They might beat the Texans. They'll probably beat the Jaguars. They're not beating the Steelers, and I'm guessing they're going to be looking from the outside in to the playoffs come uh, January. That's my prediction. Uh, all right, let's move to the NBA. Uh, we're going to do a complete switch here. Of course, we had the NBA draft. Um, we had the NBA draft this past week. Uh, I believe it was Wednesday. Uh, yeah, we had the NBA draft. Uh, Jared, just quick thoughts uh, on your end from the NBA draft. Not the, you know, pre- looking at it, not the biggest draft. There was no Zion Williamson. There was no LeBron James. There was no, and you know what I'm saying? It, there was a lot of great players, but not like foundational franchise players. So what was your thoughts on the NBA draft? Yes. Yeah, kind of like a snooze fest to be honest and really after like the seventh pick i mean i kept it on but it was like i was doing other stuff and i had it on in the background same, same thing with me yeah i i i you know i i really wanted to see where uh where ball was gonna go and that was the really the most kind of i guess intriguing uh pick uh james wiseman i think we all knew was as long as uh, golden state kept their number two overall pick that they were going to take wiseman so that was kind of a foregone conclusion, uh, you know, and now the fact that Ball ends up in Charlotte, that's interesting because we've got Michael Jordan, you know, and obviously 
LeVar Ball, who's been talking a lot of trash and saying that he can beat Michael Jordan one-on-one and all this stuff. Well, maybe we'll actually get to see that one-on-one matchup, right? Maybe maybe Jordan will lace him up again and say, all right, man, I'm going to shut you up. And, I, you know, I've got your son on my team now. So he, he's, he's – I'm, I'm taking him on. So, um, you know, other than that, I just – you're right. There, there was no LeBron James. You know, there was no Kevin Durant in this draft. And it was just there was no uh, I don't know. It, it was just there was no like spark. There was no and at least with the NFL draft. I think they just the NFL easily does a way better job of promoting and hyping up its draft. And even though it is longer and there's obviously a lot more rounds and more players that actually get drafted. With the NBA, you know, it's kind of just like, even when they are in person, it's still never really, I don't know, I never really get too excited about it. It's just kind of like, all right, cool, watch the first couple picks, and then I get the rest of my info from social media later on. So, um, and and the reason why I'm not super excited is because I don't know if there's a, a true difference maker, a guy that can come onto a team and immediately make an impact as far as wins and losses, right? I think there are guys that can be really good contributors and come in and and be factors for a team, but I don't know if we have that one guy that can come in and instantly say, okay, this team is now you know instantly better because of that player. I don't know if we have that difference maker in this draft. Uh, I, I, here's my thought on the draft is that I'm kind of the same with you. Once you got around past like the top top 10 picks, I wasn't that interested because unfortunately with college basketball season getting just absolutely interrupted by the coronavirus back in uh, February and March, we didn't get to see March Madness. And a lot of times that's where we see a couple players level up and show their playoff prowess. Buddy Heal with Oklahoma, Gordon Hayward, um, Dante DiVincenzo, A couple names where earlier on in the season, in the college basketball season, nobody knew who these guys were. And then they end up becoming lottery picks or top picks because of their performance in the tournament. So I think going into this draft, we didn't know who truly were the best players. And it was really, you know, just like watching tape and all that stuff, which, Jared, we're not going to do. You know what I'm saying? We don't care that much about um, the the NBA draft, at least the, the, the guys in the middle, to where we're going to be like, watching their tape to see what they look like, what their, what's their length, all that. So I think, the, you know, for, for fans' sake, we we were like, well, we know who LaMelo Ball is because of his dad and his brothers. Um, we know who James Wiseman is because he played for Duke and he was an amazing top prospect. And a lot of people probably knew who Anthony Edwards is only because he was projected to be number one pick, to be honest, right? And there was a lot of European players and a lot of players with odd names that people didn't know. And so that's what we had. Uh, the biggest takeaway, though, as far as player selections goes, is James Wiseman to Golden State. Because, unfortunately, we heard about Clay Thompson tearing his Achilles right. right before the draft started. So that pick for the Golden State Warriors became the most important pick of the draft. And them picking James Wiseman keeps them competitive for this year. Because I think James Wiseman is easily the most NBA-ready of the top few picks. He's ready to contribute the quickest on a good team. And I think still with Steph, still with Draymond Green, with Wiggins, now James Wiseman, the Warriors have a chance at making the playoffs. Do I think they're a contender? No, I think they need Klay Thompson to be that. But James Wiseman getting picked, he'll he'll have to learn the NBA quicker than everybody else, and, and he will be the guy I will be watching the most on TV next year. Yeah, no, just just talking about Clay really quickly. And I think as you know, I, when when I heard that news. It was like such a shock. And then you feel for the guy, right? And then to have to watch the draft, it's like, I, I don't want to watch the draft anymore. It's like, you know, you're just, you're just like sad, right? You, you just see Clay Thompson uh, go through a grueling rehab to get himself back from it, from a bad ACL injury that he suffered, missed all of last year, right? And, and uh, it was the end of a workout. Now, I don't know the exact specifics, but uh, supposedly at the very end of one of his workouts here in Southern California, you know, something happened and he ended up tearing his, his Achilles, which, you know, it can even be probably more of a grueling, uh, you know, comeback uh, of, an, of an injury than an ACL. So, you know, obviously we, we wish nothing but the best, but it's just like the dude just came off of a year recovery and now he's got to go through another year recovery as well. So 
you know, <laughs> in two years, uh, injuries to both legs. And, you know, another interesting thing as well is we all know Clay Thompson to be the, you know, sniper, three-point shooter, ace right next to, to uh, you know, Steph Curry, the, the Splash Brothers, all that stuff. But two things with Clay that I think are underrated. One, on the defensive side, he is a phenomenal one-on-one defender, right? Probably one of the yeah, best very uh, the best defender on Golden State next to Draymond Green, right? It, he, is, he is so underrated in his ability to, uh, you know, guard and be willing to take on the other team's best player. I don't think we, we give Clay enough credit for that. And number two, Clay is actually the best at moving without the ball. Right. The reason why he gets so many three point opportunities and, and wide open shots is because he moves without the ball. He doesn't just stand there and wait for Steph Curry to make a play and, and make something happen for Clay. Clay takes it upon himself to move screen after screen after screen. Like I think he actually like travels the most. They track it. He travels the most on the court. Like he's got like the most miles run on the court, you know, throughout his his uh, his short career so far in the NBA because he literally runs off of screen so much in an offensive set. So you're right. The, the Warriors are, are really going to miss not only his three-point shooting, but what, what he does for them on an offensive side as far as moving around and getting open shots. And then on the defensive side, being that guy who, you know, is willing to take on the other team's best defender. So, you know, the Warriors, obviously, hopefully Wiseman can come in and, and fill that big man role, but you cannot replace Klay Thompson and what he does on the court. No, no, and that's why I said, Jared. I mean, he, he, Clay Thompson is such a good, good, good and key player that I think the Warriors went from a possible contender to barely making the playoffs. If it all makes, yeah, the you're not, you're, you're not contending for a championship with one of the two. You need no, both Splash yeah. Brothers. And period. Draymond Green, Draymond Green, it fits with other guys, and that's not Andrew Wiggins, and that's not James Wideman, and it's not Kelly Oubre either. It, it, it's Steph Curry and Clay Thompson, and they got lucky enough to get Kevin Durant, which solidified them. Um, solidify the championships those years, but we saw the years before with Draymond and, and, and with Clay and Steph, that's when they won the championship. So you can't win with one. You saw last year how bad they were the minute Clay wasn't going to play for that team last season. So very interesting. Uh, let's move into NBA free agency, and that's where Jared's face is going to start smiling uh, because his Los Angeles Lakers have already won the free agency market. It, just, just give Rob Polinka the general manager of the year award, the executive of the year. Um, they have already improved their team from last year, and they won the NBA championship last year. You know, you guys all know I like the Clippers, but it's been tough the last week with the Lakers, you know, advancing themselves so much further. One of the ways, stealing Montrez Harrell from the Clippers. I don't know what happened. Stealing is such a harsh, harsh word, Nick. They stole. You know, I would really, I would really prefer if you would, if you would redo that and and change and take stealing out of it, please. No, I'm kidding. They didn't, they didn't steal Montrez Harrell. Coming into the offseason, the Clippers knew that they had to pick between Marcus Morris and Harrell. They decided Morris was the better player. Paid him like sixty million dollars a year um, to play for him. Meanwhile, Markeith Morris and him have the same bank account, and the Lakers go and sign Markeith Morris for 25 cents. So it's a great, it's a great offseason for us, Jared. It really is. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I guess I'll take it away from here. That was your little uh, two-minute rant there, and, and hey, I appreciate it. Uh, but yes, the Lakers have somehow only gotten better after winning. Championship and listen, they they not only pick up Montrez Harold who gets to stay in the same city, doesn't have to move homes, just gets to go across the hallway to the winning side of the arena uh, with the Lakers, right? Who uh, and Montrez Harold, by the way, also was the sixth man of the year this year, coming off the bench, averaging 18 points a game, and they also trade for Dennis Schroeder, who was runner up for um, sixth man of the year, right? So their bench which was one of the kind of lacking points, along with three-point shooting for the Lakers, just improved dramatically, right? Going from, like, probably one of the worst benches in the league to one of the best, at least on paper. They also picked up Wesley Matthews, who's kind of a 3-and-D guy. I believe he shot, like, 38% from three last year, and he can definitely play some good hard-nosed defense as well. Uh, they were able to keep Kyle Kuzma. He was uh, potentially going to be a part of one of the trades, but they keep him around. Uh, they re-signed Contavious Caldwell-Pope. 
To me, I think they paid him a little too much money, but he did prove in the playoffs last year that, you know, he was a vital three-point shooter for that team, and that was definitely something that the Lakers were lacking uh, at least early on in the season. So if he can continue his three-point shooting, then I think he'll be worth every penny. But he's got to continue to knock down shots, and, and you know, when he's wide open, he needs to take it. Uh, and then you're right. They, they were signed Markeith Morris uh, as well. And, and I believe it was either yesterday or early this morning when they ended up signing Marcus All and taking him away from the That's Toronto right. Raptors. That's right about that one. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just, you know, it, listen, it just keeps on coming. So the, the current Lakers starting lineup, and, and there could be mixing and matching around. But what I'm looking at right now is LeBron James at the point, obviously. Uh, we've got, uh, I think you can put any type of combination of Dennis Schroeder and or Wesley, Ma- Wesley Matthews at the two spot. Uh, we, let's, let's throw Contavious Caldwell Pope in there just for giggles. Uh, it, currently Anthony Davis is not listed on here because he opted out of his agreement, but he is not going anywhere. It Do does. not worry, Lakers fans. He is just trying to figure out the best way to structure his next contract with the Lakers. Uh, many people are in the know, uh, Woj especially, and, and others in the NBA are reporting that he wants to potentially structure his deal so that it lines up with LeBron James's deal. So whenever LeBron James decides to leave the Lakers, Anthony Davis, if he wants to, can leave as well. Uh, so we can just slide Anthony Davis into the, that four spot right there. And then we got Marcus Saul. So coming off the bench, we're potentially looking at Montrez Harold, like I mentioned, sixth man of the year last year, uh, Kyle Kuzma. Uh, Alex Caruso, uh, and, and then we've got really, you know, young players like Alfonso McKinney and Talon Horton Tucker, right, who were able to get some 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 minutes uh, in the bubble last year as well. So somehow, some way, this Lakers team only got better after winning the championship. They will uh, no doubt be the favorites heading into this season, and now it's about living up to those expectations, right, because it's great that the Lakers won the championship last year in the bubble, but now we're about to go to more of a full NBA season. Hopefully there won't be any you know, postponements or cancellations. Uh, we'll get a 72-game season and then the playoffs as well. So uh, you know, it, we'll see about low management and all that stuff with the season starting so quickly after last year. But I'm excited about this year, Nick. And the fact that the Clippers have only gotten worse uh, just puts a bigger whoa, whoa, smile on my face. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, okay. The Clippers have gotten worse. Yes, but not by as much as people think. And I want to explain something to you guys. Okay, we were going to lose Harold or Marcus Morris no matter what. So that's where I'm not too angry about that. I make the joke because Lakers fans love to act like they like Montrez Harold, even though they talk crap yeah, on listen, him. Listen, all really players. quick, I don't want to steal your thunder. Okay. Montrez Harold is one of those dudes that you hate him if he's not on your team because there. he is an absolute pest and he will get in your face and he will talk trash and all of that. But if he's on your team, you absolutely love him. So I didn't like him up until a couple of days ago when the Lakers signed him. But now I love him. That's my guy. That is my dude. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to I, no, I, I understand. It. It's funny. I mean, I've just been getting roasted every, every, every second left and right. I thought when they coked in the playoffs, it was over. And then we got to free agency and it got worse. Um, so I want to say this. So the Clippers did add Luke Kennard in, in, in favor of – uh, like I Lance like him. Shamit. Not a that's, Duke. He's a good player. That's, yeah, it's an improvement. We we got Serge Ibaka, which is the the replacement for Montrezl Harrell. Not that bad of a replacement, right? Uniting and, with Kawhi. And they they still have Beverly, Lou Williams, Kawhi Leonard, Ibaka Zubak, and unfortunately Paul George. Uh, and, and so the one thing about this Clippers team is their roster isn't that much worse. The problem is they don't have any playmakers. And that's why they need to get a guy like Ray John Rondo potentially to be a point guard in crunch time because Patrick Beverly isn't that. I like Patrick Beverly because it's the same thing you were just talking about with Harold, Jared. He gets in your face. He talks a lot of crap. The problem is he goes 0 for 8 from 3. And that's the difference. At least Harold was dunking the ball, you know, blocking shots, playing good defense, right? Th- th- that's the difference. So the Clippers need to find a way during this regular season to get a playmaking point guard or else they have no chance at a championship. What are your thoughts on that, Jerry? I know I, I know we, we talk a lot of crap on each other's teams, but the Clippers roster is still very good. What do you think about my opinion about the playmaker? 
Yeah, no, no doubt. They, they do need a playmaker, right? And and I'll, I'll throw two things out. Number one, um, Ros Armando has signed with the Atlanta Hawks. So that is yeah. out the window. Uh, so they're going to have to look to another, find another alternative. But no, you know, and I'll even, you know, throw out the, the Lakers, right? They've got LeBron James, who is their, you know, point guard, right? When LeBron James can technically play multiple positions on the court. Now, Kawhi Leonard, even though he's more of a shooting small forward, why not have Kawhi Leonard kind of run the offense in a sense? Yeah, you could. I, I mean, I, I, I just obviously he, he's one of the best basketball players in the world. And obviously he choked in, in the, the playoffs this past season. But listen, the guy can still bring up the ball. He's got great ball handling skills and he can create his own shot whenever he wants. I think he's a good passer. Why not put Kawhi Leonard in that point guard spot, move Patrick Beverly off ball so that you're not having to, you know, have him make all the decisions because obviously that didn't work out, um, and, and see what Kawhi Leonard can do. I, I, you know what? Or why not move Lou Williams from the sixth man off the bench into the starting lineup and, and make him be your point guard because maybe he doesn't have the the same passing ability that you would want out of a traditional point guard. But I would actually want Lou Williams handling the ball and dribbling up the court more so than Patrick, Patrick Beverly. So. I pose it back to you. Would you want to see a Kawhi Leonard point guard situation uh, and or a Lou Williams coming off the bench and now being their starter at point guard? I would much rather have Kawhi Leonard because Lou Williams defensively is a liability and Patrick Beverly defensively is a good player. So in those big moments, I still want Patrick Beverly switching on to defense and I don't trust Lou Williams in one point games on defense. So during an entire game, I'd rather have Patrick Beverly out there for his defense and, yes, have Kawhi be running the ball. Do I want maybe more minutes from Lou Williams? Yes, because it's not Doc Rivers anymore. It's Ty Lu, and maybe he'll come up with a better way to use Lou Williams. Now, they don't have Harrell, and Harrell and Lou Williams were kind of like that, that bench mob that came in and was dominant uh, over a lot of other NBA benches. And now you don't have that, so you do kind of need to incorporate your best possible lineup. You don't have that luxury of your bench being as good, so you need Lou Williams to be playing more minutes. Do I want him handling the ball? No, because I still think Patrick Beverly handling the ball and playing defense is better than Lou Williams, um, especially in big moments. I'd rather have Kawhi have the ball. Now, Jerry, we do need to move on because we're getting late in the podcast with the other teams that made moves. Now, when you look at the best teams... Uh, in- listen, I, who cares, man? Lakers <laughs> just won. We're, we're done. We're, 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 we're not going to talk about the Suns. They got Chris Paul, right? We talked about them last week. They improved, but they have no chance at the championship, right? We're not going to talk about a lot of the other West teams, because honestly, I think it's, you know, it's Clippers and Lakers, and and, and those are kind of still top, the two of the top teams. You still have Denver up there, right? Denver didn't make too many moves. I want to talk about the East real quickly. And the two best, te- or the three best teams in the East, you have... Uh, the Boston Celtics, you have – actually, there's really four teams. Boston Celtics, Toronto Raptors, Milwaukee Bucks, and now the Brooklyn Nets with the returning uh, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Every single one of these teams, Jared, has improved their roster in a way. Yeah. And that's very interesting to me because, again, the Lakers' path through the West is going to be a little bit easier than expected. That's amazing thinking about the last few years – saying that would have been the dumbest thing possible. Now it looks like they're going to have a legitimate Eastern Conference opponent whenever they do make the finals. Not to mention the Heat, who played them in the finals and won two games, they also got better. So, Jared, what are your thoughts on the Eastern Conference's moves, uh, small but big in the, in the ways that they still improve their team? Yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing to me is, and as I look at the Bucks, right, and I look at Giannis, and I think the Bucks are trying to make moves to keep Giannis there for the long term, right? Obviously, the rumors going back to the beginning of last year when it was kind of like the Bucks need to win a championship or Giannis is going to leave, right? It, he he seems like a loyal dude, not the type of guy that's going to burn the team or anything, but he's also here to win, right? He's not here to mess around and get very close. You know, he wants to kind of break that ceiling and and get the Bucks back into championship contention. So obviously they haven't been able to do that. Um, you know, Giannis was injured uh, for for some part of last year as well, and that played a factor in it. But you know, I, I think this is the Bucks right now. They're they're saying we we're we're trying to go all in and bring in everyone we can uh, to to build a team, a good enough team around Giannis to where we can go out and win. Now I think in the Eastern Conference. The Bucks right now are are still the team to beat, even though the Miami Heat 
um, ended up beating the Bucks and and made it to the the uh, finals, representing the Eastern Conference. I would still take the Bucks right now over the Heat, just looking roster to roster and comparing those two. But uh, if I'm the Bucks and and I get you know a, a real strong inkling that Giannis is is going to leave or that he's not happy anymore, I'm trading him at the deadline yeah. because here's what you can't have happen: you cannot have Giannis Harden and Kempo top three best player in the league, right? Uh, NBA Defensive Player of the Year, all that, all the accolades in the world. The Bucks cannot lose Giannis and get back nothing. They have to get something in return if Giannis does leave, whether that is draft picks, you know, first round draft picks for the next five years or uh, players back in the deal. They cannot come up dry and empty in this situation. And here's why. If the Bucks want to stay like any type of relevant in the East or just in the NBA for that matter, they have to get something in return. Uh, I just want to go over to end this podcast, the moves that these Eastern Conference teams made that I was mentioning. Yeah, sorry. I know I took on the Bucks. No, no, it's more. fine. No, no, you, you, what you said made total sense too. And that's an important factor because we heard rumors that the Lakers are going to try to get Giannis uh, in the next two years. So it's, it's very important that you brought that up. Uh, that's the last time we're going to talk about that. But let me get to this point. So I mentioned that there was there was five or so Eastern Conference teams that made moves. Toronto Raptors, they brought back Fred Van, Van Vliet. That is a huge bring back because right. he was turning into a very, very great player and potentially even an all-star for that team. The 76ers add key bench players in Danny Green, Seth Curry, and Dwight Howard. Uh, let me move up to the Milwaukee, like you mentioned, Drew Holiday. That's the big step up yeah. from... Eric Bledsoe, uh, and then let me get to these two teams. The top, the Celtics added uh, Tristan Thompson as their center. Tristan Thompson, that's a great player, a very underrated deal that wasn't worth that much. And, of course, the Brooklyn Nets, the biggest improvement in the East, adding uh, Landry Shamit and then two guys named Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. So those are technically uh, you know, they're all right. All yeah, they're right. okay players. And also, I'll tell you that, man, Listen to this Nets roster uh, before I end this podcast. Kyrie Irving at point guard, Lavert at shooting guard, Joe Harris small forward, Kevin Durant power forward, DeAndre Jordan center. The bench is Dinwiddie, Shamit, uh, Luwalu Cabaret, very solid player, Deshaun Prince, very solid young player, and Jared Allen. Man, that's a star-studded top 10 players, and that's why I'm saying – Lakers might get to the championship a little bit easier. When they play a team, as long as there's no injuries, this Eastern Conference is going to be uh, very, very good. The Heat, all, the Miami Heat also added Avery Bradley. That was the other move an Eastern Conference team made. So there you go. That's our free agent talk for today. Uh, yeah, and- I, I, really quick, I, I just wanted to, to kind of like throw out and, and give a shout out to Fred Lemby. Uh, uh, undrafted, coming out of college. And he uh, got the most money for being an undrafted player out of college, 85 wow. million over four years. So like, congrats to you, dude. Kind of just shows just because you go undrafted doesn't mean that you can't, you know, turn, become a success story and, and, and make a lot of money. So, you know, good for him, uh, obviously for showing his loyalty with staying yeah. with Toronto, but it just shows, man, it, it, you can prove yourself. You know, going to the G League, uh, you know, coming off the bench, that type of thing. And Fred Van Vliet did, did, did just that. So good for him. Absolutely, Jared. And another guy that used the NCAA tournament as a way to up himself. Right. That guy, I believe, is Wichita State. He played for under uh, Shaka Smart. And very, very uh, player that nobody knew. And now he's playing for one of the best Eastern Conference teams in the league, Toronto Raptors, who will be playing in Tampa Bay this season. Right, right. right. Uh, so he'll be uh, the We the South is what they're going to be calling themselves now. Uh, hey, so, okay. So here's the thing, right? So now that Toronto's playing in Tampa, in Florida, yeah. uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's no state income tax in Florida, That's if true. I'm not mistaken. That's true, Jared. Uh, now, like, do th- does that does that mean that the players are now going to be on, like, Florida's taxes? Because they're technically, like, staying there and living there? Like, you know, because if I'm for the Heat, I'm, I'm, I'm asking him, I'm like, hey, I just got 85 mil. I, like, I, I, I want to make sure that my well, taxes line up. Canada? Because I don't even know how Canada does it. So maybe I, Canada's I, I, even no, more I, like I don't know. I don't know. But I'm just saying, if, if I'm the players, I'm like, hey, we're, we're living in Florida. Like, I don't care if I have to buy a house. Like, I'm a resident of Florida now. I want my taxes based off of my, my status as a Florida resident. 
Seriously. Yeah, Kyle Lowry, what's Kyle Lowry getting paid? A ton. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. It's very underrated. Very underrated. But, and we will end the podcast on that note. We love to have fun on this podcast. Uh, hey, happy Thanksgiving again. Three great football games somehow end up being on that weekend. Uh, somehow the Washington the Cowboys game is good. Of course, Raven Steelers, real quick to mention, I just got a notification from our friend Ryan Johnson saying that J.K. Dobbins and Mark Ingram are in COVID protocol. So they just lost their best two running backs for the game. Pound Gus Edwards in fantasy football this week. The frauds just got worse. (laughs) All right, that's it for the podcast. Uh, We'll see you guys next week. Uh, Once again, I am Nick Neenan. I'm Jared Smith. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Be safe. Happy Thanksgiving, guys.